Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our live creator chat with comics legend Kurt Musiak. Before we start, uh, I'll be doing this in an interview uh, fashion, but I wanted to let the audience know that we encourage you to ask Kurt anything. Anything you'd like uh, to inquire or comment can be put in the text chat to the side of the screen, and I'll be reading your commentary and questions throughout our session. Um, now with that out of the way, let's get started with introductions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kurt. Well, thanks very much for having me. Wonderful. Um, for those of you who might not know, Kurt Busiek broke in as a comics writer in 1982 with stories in Green Lantern number 162 and Power Man and Iron Fist number 90, both issues coming out on the same day. Since then, he's worked on just about everything from action comics to Zot, uh, including runs on Avengers, Iron Man, Superman, Conan, and others, along with co-creating Thunderbolts, The Power Company, and more. Nowadays, he's best known for his work on the multiple award-winning Marvels and Astro City, and he's been turning more and more to creator-owned work as of late, including such projects as The Autumn Lands, Superstar, Shock Rockets, and The Wizard's Tale. Currently, he is working on more Astro City and the return of Aerosmith. And with that, I've talked a lot, so now I will let you take it away. Uh, for anybody who might not be familiar, could you give us a little bit of background on both Astro City and Aerosmith? I can. Um, uh, Aerosmith is uh, a uh, fantasy uh, I guess it's an alternate reality story. It's set uh, during World War I in a world where magic and the creatures of folklore have been part of ordinary life since the time of Charlemagne. Um, so World War I uh, has, you know, trenches and barbed wire and mustard gas and all the stuff that happened in our world, but it also has uh, wizards and trolls and dragons. Um, and... Uh, the, uh, the lead character in Aerosmith is uh, Fletcher Aerosmith, a, uh, a young man from the uh, United States of Columbia um, who runs away from home to join up with the Overseas Aero Corps and learn magic and be part of the war effort because his head is full of noble dreams about dashing aviators. Um, in this world, though, uh, he doesn't have a biplane. He gets issued a, a, a dragonette, a small dragon that sits on his shoulder, and they teach him a couple of magic spells, including a spell that will allow him to transfer the power of flight from the dragonette to himself. Um, so uh, he goes off to war, fairly ill-prepared, like many of the, the, the real-world pilots, um, and uh, over the course of the, of the book, Aerosmith, so smart in their fine uniforms, um, he learns that uh, his, uh, uh, his, his uh, expectations about the nobility and uh, um, sort of uh, heroic legend of um, uh, fighting in the war is uh, perhaps a little uh, mistaken and the, the actual war is dirty and bloody and dangerous. Um, and he winds up being part of things that he never thought he would be. Mm -hmm. uh, Aerosmith, uh, we are um, reissuing uh, the whole first series in an oversized hardcover that's being remastered and uh, uh, to present the artwork the way the artist Carlos Pacheco originally intended it to be. Um, uh, and we're also launching a new series that'll run in comic stores and will be collected in book form later. So this is this is the this will be the first in a series of, of graphic novels. Um, should I go on to Astro City now? Yeah, please, please do. Yeah. Um, Astro City is a superhero series, but it's a fairly unusual superhero series. It takes place in Astro City, uh, a, uh, a metropolis that has probably more than its share of superheroes, uh, supervillains, monsters, mad scientists, and more. Um, but instead of telling action adventure stories of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, traditional superhero type stories. Daring uh, do. What's that? It's a daring do. Right. Um, Astro City is much more about what it's like to live in a world like that 
whether you're a superhero, a bystander, a reporter, an alien spy in disguise reporting back to your, your home planet on when would be a great time to invade, a, a, um, uh, a supervillain who's gotten away with the perfect crime and realizes that he doesn't really want to get away with the crime because when you get away with the crime, nobody knows it was you. <laughs> um, uh, the daughter of, you know, a third generation daughter of a family of superheroes and what her life is like, basically, we take you into that world and show you uh, what is it like to live in a world like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, uh, the Astro City Metro Book One, which comes out in March, um, is a 500 page collection of uh, the first three years of the series. Mm -hmm. The series has been running for, I don't know, a little over 25 years now, I think. Um, maybe a little somewhere around there. Um, anyway, uh, so the Metro book is the first book in a collection that is going to collect the whole series in uh, uniform volumes. Uh, six volumes will take us through everything we've got now, but we're also starting a new series at Image Comics. Um, so again, it will be an ongoing series uh, and more volumes will be coming. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear it. Those are both, I love Aerosmith and I, but I've been reading Astro City for such a long time that anytime you put out new content, I'm I'm thrilled to sort of return to that world and the, the minutiae of the people who live there. Um, I, I, sh I should also mention that on uh, Aerosmith, I'm working with Carlos Pacheco, mm -hmm. uh, a Spanish artist. He's the co-creator um, uh, and uh, um, on Astro City, we're working with uh, Brent Anderson is the interior artist and uh, Alex Ross uh, does, uh, he does our painted covers and he also contributes a lot of uh, uh, character designs, uh, designing the, the, the superheroes. Um, sometimes he'll even, you know, make up a set of characters and say, here, write a story about these guys. Um, and Alex is very good at it. So uh, we usually end up saying, yep, sure, let's do that. <laughs> The key to collaboration. Yes. Uh, so you've been such a big force in the comics industry. And for both of these titles, um, as you mentioned, you're working with some collaborators that, you know, you have long term experience with both on these titles and then on other projects that you've worked um, on. I'm curious how your partnerships have evolved over time. Um, with these collaborators. Has anything changed significantly? Have there been any surprises along the way? Um, I think that the work process evolves as we, uh, uh, you know, as we get used to working with one another. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, uh, working with um, working with Brent. I mean, Brent started in his career uh, a few years before I did, and by the time he and I were working together, uh, I was a little nervous. You know. Here's this guy, Brent Anderson. He's worked on the X-Men. He's done all of this cool stuff. And here I am. I have to say, no, could we, could we see it this way instead of that way? <laughs> um, so, so I, I, you know, I was, I was, I was hesitant to speak up in the collaborative process. Um, but that goes away fairly quickly. And now we've, you know, we've spent decades uh, batting ideas back and forth and, and uh, making suggestions. So, so it's, it's very, very collegial now. When we started, Brent's wife was pregnant with their first child. He has since graduated college. So wow. <laughs> now, now he's giving you notes. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but I, that, that, that may come. <laughs> um, Are, with, oh, go, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, with Carlos, it's a, been a slight reverse. Um, that Carlos, uh, when we first worked together, uh, we did some Avengers projects at Marvel, including Avengers Forever. Um, and uh, Carlos uh, was a very, you know, prominent comic book artist at the time. Um, but uh, he had been a big fan of Marvel's and other work that I'd done. Mm -hmm. um, so so he, you know, he explained to me, oh, I get to work with Kurt Busiek. Um, and I, I, I kind of had to, to, to say, look, you know, let's just kick things back and forth. I want your ideas. I'm not going to just tell you what to do. 
Um, and again, we had to kind of relax into a, into a working process. Mm -hmm. We work very differently on, on, on both books. Um, on Astro City, I write what's called a script, which reads like a screenplay. So when Brent is drawing it, he knows what the dialogue is going to be. Um, with Carlos, uh, we work in a system that's called plot style. I'll type up the story, breaking it down panel by panel as I see it. Mm -hmm. But the main thing I'm getting across is this is what beat by beat needs to happen in the story. And then Carlos gets to tell it his way. It opens him up more visually. Mm -hmm. um, and once he's done drawing it, I'll then go in and write the dialogue. Um, he'll have a pretty good idea of what kind of dialogue it's gonna be um, because that's in the plot, but I don't do the, the the, the, the actual dialogue writing and the narrative writing until I'm, I'm playing off of his artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives him more control over the, the pacing um, and, uh, and the page design and that sort of thing. Um, and that's something, you know, whatever works best to make the best comics, um, I'm happy to work that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important to be flexible, especially in a in a medium where you are going to be working with collaborators. That's yeah. I don't necessarily think it pays to be too rigid. Um, no, if you want to control the whole thing yourself, write a novel. <laughs> yes, uh, and even then, you're going to have back and forth with editors and and uh, uh, so forth. But uh, but still, you know the the final result is is your work with other people assisting you um if you're making comics the final result is a co-authored work um uh, oftentimes particularly on amazon uh, collaborators get listed as the author and the illustrator um but what comic book artists do is an illustration mm -hmm. illustration is something you can remove from a story and the story is still the same mm -hmm. um, what comic book artists are doing is they are telling the story visually. So they are very, very much co-authors. Um, sometimes it's almost like uh, if I wrote a screenplay and hand it over to the artist, they then get to direct the movie, cast the movie, act in the movie, do set designs, do costume designs, do special effects. It's just <laughs> doing a whole lot more on the page um, uh, than, uh, uh, than I am. So they're, they're very much, very much a co-author of the work. Yeah. How do you feel about your, um, the way your work is interacting with the audience? Because the interesting thing about a comic book or really any piece of art is that you create it, you birth this thing, and then you let it out into the world to be interpreted by others. And with such a large body of work, I would assume that you get to see a lot of interpretation of your work um, that may open up things about it that you hadn't even thought of or may take it in directions that you didn't intend. Um, that's certainly true. Um, that uh, I've always felt that writing fiction, I mean, any kind of writing, but writing fiction particularly is a kind of a two-part telepathy. Mm -hmm. um, that that uh, the first stage happens between the creators and the page. Mm -hmm. And the second stage happens between the page and the reader. Mm -hmm. Whatever we've put on that page, we've done what we've done. And the reader coming to it, the process of reading it, they bring their own, uh, uh, their own viewpoint, their own perception. Um, and every story is going to be a little different for every reader because they're the ones that are doing that, that second step. Mm -hmm. We had a story uh, that's, that's in the, uh, the first Astro City Metro book that um, I had a very difficult time as we were writing it because I was trying to tell, uh, trying to tell the story of a young woman who lives in kind of the old world mystic part of town. And she's got all of these, these mystic characters and dangers and things around her but she also has generations of uh, training in, you know, what mystic signals, signals do you use to keep your house safe? Um, what do you do uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to safeguard yourself? But she works in downtown Astro City, which is kind of the more science fiction-y area. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And there you depend on the superheroes to keep you safe. Um, so this was a story about a woman leaving home to go work in a different environment where she's losing control over her own ability to protect herself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting, you know, as we were doing it, I kept rewriting script and rewriting script to try to get across what I felt the story was. And it went out into the, into the world and people read it wildly differently because uh, some people read it as I had intended it. The story of a young woman finding, you know, at the end of the story, she goes back home, she decides to live and work in, uh, in her home neighborhood. Um, and to me, that was her finding a place where she could be empowered, where she could stand on her own two feet and take care of herself. And for a lot of readers, they saw it as a story of her failure to go out into the new world, into the frontier, essentially, mm -hmm. and, uh, and thrive in that new location. Um, so there was a whole lot of discussion online and in letters and things like that over what the story was about. And in the end, the story won best single issue of the year at the Eisner Awards. So <laughs> whether or not, you know, what, what, what I intended and what readers got from it, um, it was clearly a valuable reading experience. It, you know, even though readers disagreed on what the story was about, that reaction was strong enough that either way, they felt it was a, a very good story. Yeah, that it resonated with them. Yeah. I think that's so so interesting because I think that it I mean that opens up a whole discussion that that we'd have to add another hour to this chat to about how how we view um modernity and like what what is the value of modernism versus the value of these old ways and can they coexist together um which is fascinating because in Astro City that's what you're doing is you're having all these disparate things sort of coexisting all together yeah, what, what I found out over the years of re writing Astro City, you know, I knew that I was using superheroes to sort of be uh, a metaphor yeah. for different conflicts that could arise in, in the re real world. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Astro City is a world in which there are these forces out of our control mm -hmm. that mess up our lives and we have to endure them and find a way to get by. Um, and that is something that we all do in the real world. You know, the forces we deal with aren't storm gods and supervillains, but, you know, they might be a hurricane, they might be the political situation, um, uh, they might be social attitudes toward sexuality and whatever. Yeah. The world is always overwhelming. And we have to find ways to navigate through that. Um, and without me intending that, Astro City turned out to be a big metaphor about um, about just dealing with life. Yeah. Uh, so so it 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 found a power in a place that I you know that was not intentional on any of our parts. But it's nice when it works out that way. Yeah, it really is. Uh, we have a comment from Ryan who says, I appreciated the distinction between illustrators and comics artists. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, oh goodness, we have another question hot off the press. Uh, I always felt that your work hits a great balance of letting the art do its part to tell the story while keeping things very interesting on the literary side. There's a quality assurance to anything with your name on it in part because you work so well with great collaborators. And that one is from Bob. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I try to um, make sure that, you know, whatever goes into the story is going to interact with the art well. Um, I can't draw very well, but I can visualize things well enough so that I can sketch out a page, I can see it in my head, um, and I have a pretty good sense of what's too much to fit on a page. Um, but also, even when I write a full script, when Brent or whoever is done with the artwork, um, I will I, I get to go back into the script before it's lettered and say, well, we need to add a little bit here or we need to subtract there. Um, one time I was working with a, an editor at DC who said that it always bothered him when I do a, a, a lettering pass on the script 
because he said, you know, you've got all this good writing and you cut it. And I say, I cut the stuff we don't need anymore. You know, <laughs> because, because if I've got a caption that, that says something or creates a tone or hits a character moment and the artist has drawn it in a way that we don't need those words anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to get them out of there so that, so that the art can do that part of the job and I'll let the writing do something else. Yeah. Uh, so, so having that ability to go back in at the lettering stage and, and make sure that the writing and the art um, uh, play off each other well, uh, I think is a very important part of the process. Yeah. How did you pick uh, Carlos Pacheco to work on, on Aerosmith? What was it about his art that you felt was really working for, for the story that you two had planned? Well, first off, I should mention that I didn't exactly pick Carlos. <laughs> Carlos and I started working together because uh, he was, he had a, a contract renegotiation at Marvel. He'd been drawing X-Men comics. And he said that he wanted to do, you know, if he was going to sign up for another few years at Marvel, he wanted to do an Avengers project and he wanted me to write it. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, we'd never spoken to each other. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so, you know, I was very flattered there, um, but, uh, uh, but we did Avengers Forever together and it came out quite well. Um, so we started talking about doing other stuff together. Aerosmith wasn't something I invented that I then had to find an artist for. Aerosmith was something that Carlos and I came up with together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and part of that was he did this one issue of, uh, uh, of Avengers Forever where we had, we had a look into the private life of Kang the Conqueror, uh -huh. <clears throat> who's gonna be, excuse me, who's gonna be a major villain in the movies um, coming up. But, um, uh, but Kang has this really odd looking costume in the comics. Mm -hmm. um, he's got magenta, hip high, pinstripe boots um, and other stuff. And Carlos said that he didn't want to change Kang's costume. He wanted to make it look like this is what a badass wears in Kang's culture. So he <laughs> gave him all of these weapons that had like sort of filigree to them and fancy design that it was a, it was, it was a very like sort of uh, uh, Louis of France kind of world where everything was, was uh, decorative. Um, and he did that so well that I thought if we're going to make up a project together, it should be a project that takes advantage of his world building skills of his, his being able to throw in that background detail that gives you that, uh, uh, that sense of a convincing world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were some other factors that went into it, um, but, uh, but, but Aerosmith was designed from the beginning to play into Carlos's strengths as an artist. Um, because it was it was intended for him right from the start. Yeah. When you guys set out to do the world building together, I mean, you're you're blending World War One and magic, as you mentioned. How does that look from a research standpoint? How do you go about meshing those things, making them work together? Well, I um, I will admit that when we put together the world of Aerosmith, I I know that I'm not the world's best historian. Um, so I, I had a, I, I asked a friend of mine, uh, Lawrence Watt Evans, who's a Hugo winning science fiction and fantasy writer, um, to, to build me the world. I, I told him, this is what happened at the time of Charlemagne. And this is the situation we have today. Please tell me what the history, uh, is of, of, uh, of Europe, mm -hmm. you know, that gets us from here to there so that I could... I could include things like um, uh, that uh, that in this world, France is called Gallia, and uh, Germany is is a Prussian Empire rather than Germany because the wars that unified Germany didn't happen the same way, um, and we have the country of Lotharingia, which used to exist but broke up over the centuries in our world, but in this world, it didn't. Um, uh, so so um, uh, Lawrence put together this historical document of how everything could fit together. And he told me 
okay, well, because it happened this way, Spain never got united. So you've got four different kingdoms down here. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and lots of little details like that. Um, but it's also to a degree uh, a fantasy. So I don't want to take the, the alternate history and make it so unrecognizable that you, 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 you know, that you have a World War I that doesn't resemble the real world, 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 world War I. Mm -hmm. So there's some degrees that it's probably not realistic, um, uh, but it needs to feel like this could have happened. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, so as we travel through the world, you know, we see vampires in the army. Um, we see uh, uh, rock trolls who live in the hills with their, their homes being bombarded. Um, uh, we see, uh, you know, brownies from English legend um, uh, serving in the wartime because, uh, uh, because they, you know, they want to get back home, start a family. You know, what they do is, is you know, they, they, they fix shoes and uh, they, get, they, they, get, they get paid in bowls of milk. Um, and they think this expansion of society is a good thing because then there's more shoes and then there's more milk. <laughs> and uh, so, so, that, so this, this, this brownie who's, who's in, this, in the middle of this, this big war, um, he's kind of like, you know, a hobbit in uh, Lord of the Rings or something. Um, his focus is on his kind of pastoral existence. Yeah. Um, and everything filters through that. And if I do something like that, all of a sudden, you know, the, 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 the reality of his world comes into relief because he's, he's not acting like a fantasy character. He's acting like a person. Yeah. Uh, and that's that just created rules for your, for your universe, right? Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, is it, we have a question from Patricia who mentioned, uh, she says, you mentioned movies. Is Aerosmith being turned into a movie? Well, I mentioned movies. I was talking about Kang the Conqueror, who's going to be in some of the Marvel Aven uh, 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 Avengers movies. But um, Aerosmith and Astro City have both been sort of regularly the subject of interest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there has seldom been a time in the last 15, 20 years that they haven't been under option one place or another. Mm -hmm. um, Aerosmith is currently being developed for, I can't really say, let me just say a movie or television project. Um, <laughs> and, and that said, there is a long road between being developed and actually showing up on a screen. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the pitfalls are, are, are numerous and, and easy to fall into. So all I can really say is that both are, are, are in the works to one degree or another, and whether or not they will come out the other end as a finished product, I don't know yet. We, we hold out hope. Uh, Bob says they would both make great movies, especially Aerosmith. And we have another question. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing with Bob. <laughs> <laughs> he also says Astro City needs a show on HBO, and I'll also heartily agree with that. Um, we are sadly running short on time. I wanted to make sure that all of our librarians get a chance to um, find out where they can follow you outside of this conference. Well, the easiest place to find me is probably on Twitter. Um, I am Kurt Busick on Twitter. Um, I'm also on Facebook, um, uh, again, Kurt Busick, um, and uh, uh, I'm a little bit on Tumblr, um, uh, but uh, I also have a very, very um, out of date web page, but that's got an email link to, to, to reach me through there. Um, and, and eventually it will be less out of date, but in the meantime, it's there. 
You can also always reach out to Image Comics with any questions you may have for Kurt or any of the collaborators, uh, or if you need ARCs or preview content for any of the titles that we've talked about today. Um, I wanna thank you so much, Kurt, for talking with us. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to say to our audience before we, we close out for the afternoon? I just say I'm, I'm happy to be talking to librarians and, and uh, other such you know, library involved people. My, my mom was a library aide. Um, I've been a, a fervent library user where I grew up in New England and where I am today in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, and uh, I love the fact that, that my work is available in libraries. Uh, so so uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a treat for me to be able to talk to, to all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, LUJ Tech also says, thanks, librarians appreciate you too. I think that that's as a great way to close out our session. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. All right, have a fantastic day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.